Hello, friends, and welcome back to Stories About Entitled People. In the first story, we'll tell about a client whose impatience cost him a quarter million dollars. But before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you're new here, and turn on notifications so you don't miss a new video every single day. Here we go. Okay, that'll be four weeks. A million years ago, I worked for a leasing company. We leased anything from manufacturing equipment to jets, but our bread and butter was computers. One fine day, a customer calls in to find their salesman's on vacation. They don't like that, not one bit. And after being told that no, they will not be getting the number to his hotel in Aruba, they're passed on to Tommy. Tommy was the effing new guy, but in a good way. The customer would ask for something and he'd spend two days reading white papers, benchmarks, and calling vendors to find the answer himself when there was a guy fully conversant in that technology two cubes away. Anyway, the customer wants 16 workstations in a hurry, SGI Octane dual processor with 128 megabyte video cards, four gigabytes of memory, and computers. They don't care how much it costs, but they need them as soon as possible. Tommy tells them he'll call back in an hour, he needs to speak to the vendors. Vendor one will take three weeks at least, they're out of stock. Vendor 2 will take 2 weeks and cost 20% more since they have to upgrade existing systems, SGI themselves, quote, 3 weeks. Tommy, for the first time in his life, remembers we had a former executive from SGI on staff and calls him, begging for a contact that might make it faster. Executive, how about today? We have 20 of them in the warehouse. Sure, they're supposed to go to customer, but that won't be for another 2 months. We can play some games with serial numbers on the lease after the replacements come in. Tommy thanked him and called the customer back. Customer, it's been almost two hours. Next time, don't promise a deadline you can't meet. Tommy, yeah, I know, and I'm sorry. I had to work pretty hard to track down what you need, and, well, I've got some good news and some bad news. Customer, you called vendor one? Tommy, yep, and they can have them for you in three weeks. Customer, you call any other vendors? Tommy, vendor two. They want a markup, but can have it in two weeks. I also spoke with customer. What about the manufacturer? Tommy, I called them too. They also went three weeks, but we have customer. How much of a markup does vendor two want? Tommy, 20%, but that doesn't matter because customer. Go ahead and order them. Tommy, you haven't even heard the customer. If I never hear another effing word out of your mouth, it'll be too soon. Just get it ordered and I expect paperwork by 8 a.m. tomorrow. The customer paid an extra quarter million dollars plus interest and fees and the guys in services got an extra two months to play Doom. With the reship delays on the order, they didn't get their machines for four weeks. I hope Tommy learned his lesson. <sighs> Some people, you're just glad when they won't let you help them. Others, you bend over backwards, break a few vertebrae, and their appreciation makes it all worth it somehow. Remember, people, be the kind of person other people love to help. And our second story. You want to take my entire salary as a volunteer pension contribution? Okay, then. This happened a very long time ago, 25 plus years, and is theoretically still going on. I was happily working in a local office in my 20s when I was, out of the blue, headhunted by another company. The position was a promotion, more money, and I was to be trained to take over from the office manager when he retired. I took the job. It was horrible. The work was nothing like they'd said. I was basically looking after a bunch of idiots who couldn't tell their butts from their elbows or be honest about their work timings. They lied on job sheets, didn't turn up for work, and I spent the entire time dealing with crisis after crisis. I'd been there about three months and was looking for a way out when the manager suddenly announced the office was closing. Imagine quiet dances of joy on my part. No one else was happy, though. I quietly asked the manager if he knew this was happening when he'd offered me the job, and he refused to answer. This was a very valuable lesson for my future because it made me realize that not everyone has your best interests at heart. A few days later, I got my monthly pay slip, and for the first and only time in my life, it had a negative value. I nearly had a heart attack. From my salary, they'd taken not only the emergency tax, which they didn't need to do because they had my correct forms and hadn't in the previous pay slips, but also a large chunk for the company's pension scheme, which I didn't have to join because of my age. The HR department had decided I had to be older than I was because of the job I had. I was so upset I hadn't signed up for this and asked for it back. The HR department basically told me to go do one and they wouldn't consider it. 
even though their paperwork said that at their discretion they could cancel my voluntary pension contribution. There was nothing I could do. I was very smugly told there wasn't anything in the scheme's rule book to cover their taking money in these circumstances. I was spitting feathers when I had to pay them before I could leave. Admittedly, it was only a couple of pounds, but it was the principle. Now, here's where the malicious compliance comes in. A few months later, to my surprise, the pension people rang me at my new place of work and asked where they could send me a check for my contributions to. I thought about it for a split second before saying, no, I'm good. It can stay in your pension scheme. They were so shocked and kept insisting they should send me a check, and I just said, no, keep it in the scheme. You wanted it, you got it. The reason I did this was because when I moaned to my dad about this, dear old dad had laughed and pointed out that the scheme would be sending me statements every year to tell me how much my contribution had increased and how much I would be getting and asking whether I had any questions. Wisely, or rather unwisely, he pointed out that this would cost a lot more than the amount I had paid in, so I left it there. They insisted it should come out of my salary so they can damn well invest it for me. Over the years, I've been contacted by them offering to pay me different amounts of money to settle it, and I've said no, I'm good each time. When I got married, I dutifully filled out all the paperwork for a change of name and sent it off to them. This kicked off another round of let us settle with you and me saying no. In three years, I'll be entitled to a lump sum of approximately 75 pounds plus an annual pension of 17 pounds. I suspect that over the years, it's cost them a lot more to manage than that. Quite frankly, I may not claim it when the time comes, as apparently that would kick off a lot more paperwork, as they have to have a reason for people not to claim. Admittedly, looking back on all this as I type it, it seems so silly and pathetic, but it still brings a smile to my face when I think of the panic in the little man's voice when I told him my minuscule to them, but entire salary to me, could stay in the scheme. He did try to force me to take the money, but as I pointed out to him, there wasn't a rule covering money taken in this situation, but there was a rule saying all contributors accepted by the scheme had to be processed. And our last story. Boss tried to accuse me of theft while I was in Switzerland. So this story involves a few characters. A hat manager, Dan. Assistant manager, Silly. Store boss, Sal. Regional head, Mark. I worked for a company very recently that was the UK's largest mobile and electronics retailer. I live in a small town and for quite a while was working in a branch around an hour's travel away from my home. This changed back in March when my local store was getting a refurbishment and needed additional staff. I jumped at the chance to cut two hours travel and the cost of that out of my day. Things like they often do started great, the store reopened and had a lot of hype for the first month and business was great. Two months in, my boss Dan tells me Silly has handed in her notice and would I like the job. I snap his hand off, needing the extra hours in pay. The only problem is Silly decided she was going to ask for her letter of resignation back and my promotion is, I guess, off the table. Which sucks, but it is what it is. Chalk it up as a loss and move on. A good friend of mine who's at uni has had a break, so I decided to spend a weekend in Switzerland visiting and when I come back, the atmosphere has changed in the store. A month after, I'm brought into the manager's office by Dan and Sal. Dan starts quizzing me on our procedures while Sal takes notes. I'm accused in this meeting of stealing phones and cash by Dan. He asks me where they went, refuses to show me evidence after I ask to see, and suspends me from the store while he investigates. Now I know I haven't taken anything, but I have the script from the meeting and all the time in the world to figure this out. I was given two dates on which I was told I had been seen taking phones and money. I checked my work schedule, and I wasn't in store. I checked my phone's pictures to figure out what I was doing. Turns out I was in Switzerland all along. I called the HR team to try and make sense of this, and the number Dan gave me to contact during my suspension was wrong. I call Sal, he assures me things will be investigated, and invites me back to the store the next week to address what I've been accused of. So I have a week... And in this week, I pick apart everything in the script from our meeting, from Dan lying about days I worked to lying about days he worked, said he was in the store the same day I had to call him and tell him his new phone arrived, refusing to show me evidence, and much more. Rather than come in to respond to the accusations, I made it perfectly clear to Dan and Sal that I won't be able to respond until I see the CCTV from the dates. 
Dan's face turned white as he scrambles to try and find the CCTV mysteriously. He's no longer showing me something from the dates I asked, but a month earlier. I know there won't be anything, so I watch, and after a few minutes, I ask what I'm meant to be seeing. I crap you not. After 30 minutes of in there re-watching myself and Dan leave the security room, and the only things he's shown me is my colleague accidentally handing a traded-in phone back to a customer, and that's it. At this point, I'm curious, because it's clear Dan hasn't watched the CCTV, didn't check the rotas, didn't check his own schedule, and as such has fabricated everything. I'm livid and tell Sal WTF. He drops the investigation and offers me additional week paid suspension as an apology. I can't stand the idea of going back from my suspension only to have to work with Dan and Silly again. I take sick leave, but come payday, nothing's there. I call HR and Dan and Sal have never placed me on suspension. I launch a grievance against Dan, making it clear I can't work for someone who's been so malicious without any cause. I don't feel safe working for him. Because of the sheer volume of balls ups, Dan makes this goes to my regional head, Mark. Mark already has issue with Dan and loves the fact he's now got something to use against him. I spend three hours with Mark, made 26 pages of notes, popped into my old store during the fiasco. No one knew where Dan had gone as it was being internally investigated. As I understand it, he's writing me a letter, has to go and retrain. I may have told Sal that I may have told Sal that should he have Dan write me a letter, retrained, and explain to all my old colleagues what happened, I'd go back. Didn't say it'd be for longer than the day. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.